It would be silly to say I, I didn't like helping create Beetlejuice with V. It was a fun, creative process in the beginning. We didn't know it would go and become a classic character at the time. We didn't know that vampires would have a standard set in Lost Boys. Thanks to Greg Canham and V and Mine's collaboration on that, I was fortunate enough to be involved in, in the sloth makeup for Goonies with Tom Berman. The universe has attracted me and pushed me in different directions, and I've really not been involved in makeup that I actually hated because I always thought I could bring something to it. Taking a show like Lost, which was all casualty and character makeup driven, it's subtle stuff, but it's something you can be proud of because if your audience doesn't see what you've done, you've kind of fooled them. I was into magic when I was a kid. I love to fool people and, and trick them. So if I can trick them with magic tricks and makeup, then I've done what I want to do. Hi, I'm Steve Laporte and I'm in the chair. Someone who grew up in the late 60s, early 70s, you're exposed to uh, monster movies. We had a Sunday afternoon show called Mystery Theater. So you would see Ray Harryhausen movies and Frankenstein and The Wolfman. So I think those are little images as a young kid that you know, you're attracted to the creatures, the characters. You didn't really understand what makeup was. Also, when I was young, six, seven years old, I built monster models. So to me, the three-dimensional creature was something that really attracted me. I would paint and draw and you know build stuff with whatever scraps of wood were around the house, because in those days, if you want a toy, you build it yourself. It's a culmination of many things that pushed me towards the makeup area. I discovered Famous Monsters magazine one summer and then flipped through that, and that's where I first saw something by Dick Smith, which was the Legend of Dorian Gray classic you know, face that he did for a film. So that kind of got the juices flowing. Understanding of makeup came much later. I didn't plan to be a makeup artist. I was going to be a commercial artist. That was my goal in life. That was the picture I had in front of me. I wasn't doing well in, in school, in high school. I had a really low grade point average my first year. And right after that, they developed a vocational program. And across town at a satellite school, they had a program for commercial art. It was three hours a day, total immersion, silkscreen printing, line shot camera printing, putting together portfolios, fashion drawing, technical drawings, ink washes, airbrush, all that stuff in high school. And because I had kind of an artistic interest when I was younger, I dallied with oil paints and drawing and sketches and I did spook houses in my garage by stuffing clothes and making dummies across the room in the dark and drop trash can lids and charge kids a quarter to come in and be scared. You know, you can see where all the juices were flowing and then once I had kind of an artistic direction pointed towards me, that's kind of what I followed. Uh, the makeup was kind of an accident. As I realized makeup was a profession, of course, Dick Smith's name is one that comes up a lot through Famous Monsters Magazine. That's one you're exposed to. Later on, when Planet of the Apes came out, John Chambers was a name that was dashed about quite a bit. Of course, Jack Pierce, who did you know the Frankenstein makeup, that was another name you knew. You, you could attach the name to the visual of the character. This guy created from nothing, putty and cotton and collodion and spirit gum, which attracted you know, me, the, to show you, you don't need all the special gadgets and products to create something really cool. You have to keep up with the times and move forward and learn new materials and new techniques. But it's always nice to have learned and been educated, I think, in the foundation of your knowledge of whatever career you choose, so you know how far you can go or have gone. My affiliation with Ringling Brothers kind of came quite by accident. I was in high school, I had a partial scholarship to continue my, my art into a trade school slash tech school in Oklahoma. I was ready to go to school. I was back from a senior trip, had a few months to go before we started the new semester, and I was flipping through the channels on the TV and saw an advertisement for clown auditions. I was pretty much kind of the class clown in a lot of my classes anyway. I was very outgoing and I liked kind of performing and getting out in front of people. It didn't bother me. So I thought this may be fun. You know, they make you a clown for a week and you jump out of a car and get a pie in the face. And I said, that'd be a really fun thing to do before I go away to school. Well, when I arrived, I realized it was an audition for, the, for their circus school, which they call clown college. Much like today's standards, you have Cirque du Soleil, they have these circus schools, they use acrobatics, they teach all these skills to put you into that circus box of skills. In the 70s, this, this was the forefront of that type of training. 
So I auditioned, was taken backstage to take the makeup off of me that they had put on me for the audition. And it exposed me to this magic world of all of these performers coming in to get ready for the show. And a lot of them were not too much older than me and I saw their life. It captured me. So I kept coming back every show to visit, sit backstage, watch them put their makeup on, watch them build their props, watch them get dressed. And it, it struck me. And one of the guys pulled me aside and said, you know, if you really want to do this, write them a lot of letters, stay in communication. So that's what I did. I took my commercial art skills, drew a little logo up, made a clown college envelope, made a whole stack of them. And every two or three days, would send them a quick two paragraph letter of, my ongoing schedule of what was happening in my life. I was practicing my juggling or gone to an acrobatics class or standing on my hands or whatever it was to impress them verbally, thought that may get me under the door. And eventually I got a call and they said, you were accepted. So then I had to make the choice to tell my parents that I wasn't gonna to go to college and uh, continue my career in commercial art because I didn't know what this circus thing was going to be. I didn't know how long it would last. I just knew that I wanted a part of it and probably the best choice I ever made. The first day you're brought in and there's all these young guys and gals who were in their sweats and the first thing we saw were three former clowns or they're not in makeup Put their makeup on for us. We saw an Auguste clown makeup, which is the white around the mouth and the eyes and the flesh tones. We saw a white face and we saw a tramp makeup, which everyone knows the, the sad tramp or the chaplain-esque or the more character style of makeup. So that was my first exposure to watching makeup being applied. Other than that little bit I'd seen in the clown dressing room, they brought us through the ropes of putting on clown makeup. Then later on in the week, we had a class on how to take a cast of your nose to make a rubber nose. And the key word that they said was, this is how they did Planet of the Apes. They took a mold of the face and they made all these rubber pieces. Well, that sparked a little interest there. Also about a week later of my first day, one of the instructors who had taught makeup left early. And I inquired, I said, where did um, Keith go, our instructor? And they said, well, he got a job as a makeup artist in Hollywood. And then the light went on. So that was kind of in the back of my head. Subsequently, my friend Keith Crary, he had been offered a job at the Land of a Thousand Faces makeup show, which started in the mid 70s. The Clown College is such a basis for so many people who go into the artistic areas. And if you manage to cross over and get into California, it's a perfect training ground for the motion picture business. You know, we travel around on a train, play in big arenas. In the makeup world, you travel around in a makeup trailer, you play big sound stages, you work like a machine with a lot of people. The show must go on no matter what. I've worked with broken arms, I've worked with torn arches in my feet, I've worked with 103 temperature, I've worked with food poisoning. But when you're 18, 19, 20, and you are conditioned that way, it's perfect foundation for segueing into the film business. But I carried my makeup studies further. By the time we got to New York, about maybe four months into my first season, I picked up a stage makeup book and I picked up a film makeup book. I bought makeup at Bob Kelly. I started practicing on myself doing age makeups. You know, Stretch and Stipple. I picked up a Dick Smith book when I was in California, this magazine called The Monster Makeup Book. I was building bald caps. I was laying hair, making beards doing everything I could on my spare time to learn makeup. So I'm pretty self-taught. When I came to California doing our, our route, you know, we go all over the country. My friend Keith brought me in. By that time, he was doing makeup at Days of Our Lives. And he just had me stand there and watch him do beauty and straight makeups on the actresses. And I went and bought the same makeup that he showed me. I took the showgirls. I would practice makeup on the showgirls. I'd say, hey, can I do your makeup and put your lashes on and do all this stuff? They would help me and guide me. If I made a mistake, it didn't matter because the audience was 20 rows away. My day would consist of eating and breathing, clowning and performing and makeup. So it was 24 seven. So you're really conditioned. And in the clown, the way you're taught to learn at the Clown College is you pick it up fast or you're gonna get left behind. I was driven and after four years on the road, sending pictures back to the people I'd met in Hollywood, every time I'd come into town, I'd find another person to go interview with. I met Harry Blake over at NBC. I met Harry Merritt at CBS. Harry Merritt seemed interested in what I had to offer. I had some pictures of an ape makeup I had done, a few little prosthetic things I had done on myself or other volunteers. He said, you know, if you're coming out in about six months, I might have a position for you and I'll train you to do, you know, beauty makeup. And, you know, it's kind of a, a favor system in that day. It's a lot of nepotism, a lot of in the family. 
You had to be kind of a good old boy, you know, know everybody, but you still had to prove yourself. I never want to be given something. I want to earn it. And in the circus, you earn it. You fall behind, you get run over by an elephant, literally. I come from a vocational school background. I don't believe in going to college unless you really know what you want. But trade school, vocational school training, that's the type of training I think a lot of people who are lost, don't know what they want to do, need. For one thing, you break it down into easy to learn steps that build up and get more difficult as you go. You also have the aid and even the constructive criticism of the people on the same level as you are. And your teachers, you know, if they're a good teacher, they don't hold back. You know, they don't, they don't BS you. They tell you whether you need to work on it or not. And that came from, you know, one of my first meetings with Rick Baker. It took me a couple of weeks to track Rick down when I first met him and I met him. And the first thing he did is after looking through the meager amount of pictures and work I had to show him said, you know, you need to come back a year from now and this is what you need to work on. And it was great advice because it was not sugarcoated. One unique thing about CMS is the, the instructors have a lot of experience in the field on set in the industry. We're not just teachers who teach out of a book. We teach from experience. We have stories, we have experiences. We can tell you what it's really like to be on the set. The student's gonna benefit much greater from that than learning out of a book. I think a lot of the first things I did was, you know, making rubber masks and stuff like that. I finally got a job at Universal on the tour. Uh, for their makeup show, Land of a Thousand Faces makeup show, and they had introduced the Incredible Hulk into the show at the time. It was the finish of the show. He chases the host around the, around the arena where the show is. So I was introduced to that kind of world, uh, which involved putting a full body green makeup on a bodybuilder, nose prosthetic, a forehead, a wig, eyebrows, and a character makeup to go with it. And I did that for a while. Um, as kind of the backup guy. Yeah, you'd work once a week, once every other week. And then during a Christmas break, um, they actually had an opening. Someone moved on and I was offered to come in full time. So I did, and it didn't take long before knocking on doors and sending out resumes got me a commercial. So I did a commercial for Cup of Noodles and it just happened to be Frankenstein. So being at Universal, I had access to these Frankenstein headpieces from the makeup show. So I borrowed one of those and did my first commercial, sitting down with a little girl eating noodle soup. And from there, I did a little blurb for TV Guide magazine about women being battered. So I did a beating makeup on a woman. So those little, you know, still shoot things and a little commercial here and there is what kept me going. Of course, having a full-time job at Universal allowed me to get my chops in and get the repetition of doing the same makeup over and over. Other things that that exposed you to. You're on the studio lot. One of my actor friends who I was doing the makeup on got a job on a movie on the lower lot. It was in a Cheech and Chong movie, so I went down to the makeup department and sat there and watched him get his makeup put on. It happened to be a full body makeup, red like the Hulk. It was like a spoof kind of a thing. Through that, I started walking the halls and knocked on one door. I saw someone prepping some sideburns and a mustache and introduced myself and it was V. Neal. We exchanged names and she said, your name sounds familiar. Do you know so-and-so? And I said, yeah. She goes, I've heard your name before. And I go, it's funny because I have an answering service and I've gotten your messages before. These were the days when you would call and someone would really answer your phone for you. Well, V had the same service and I had the same service. And somehow they called me and said, oh, I got a message from so-and-so. Wait a minute, that's not me. But I know the person who you're saying and it's V Neal. So her name popped up again. And it wasn't too long after that, that uh, we met on a set later and then continued our friendship and into where we know each other today. I always tell the students, you know, especially when I ask, I give them a homework assignment, I say, you're learning, there's, there's no stopping. My slow times, there were no slow times. If I wasn't working, I was sculpting. If I wasn't sculpting, I was making a mold. If I wasn't making a mold, I was painting a rubber mask because that's what Rick Baker told me to do. And that's what I tell students to do. You, you fill every spare time feeding that artistic monster that you need to create within you to move ahead because there's a lot of people who want to be in this business. A lot more want to be in it now than when I started out. I think one of the first things that I saw that really sparked, really driven me, there were two movies. One was called Devil's Reign, which Tom Berman did. It was a, a makeup on Ernest Borgnine. It was a melting makeup on camera. It was a, a, a really interesting makeup at the time. It was 
gelatin pieces that were melted off camera with a heat lamp. I was late for the clown dressing room getting ready for the show because I had to run from the theater after seeing that movie. Another one was Star Wars. And it was like right in the end of my, my time in the circus. But when I saw Star Wars and saw that cantina scene, and then about a week later saw Cinefantastic magazine that had an article about Rick Baker and the creation of all this. I worked on everything. So it was clowning all day, makeup as much as I could. When I'm here and learning, it's doing the Hulk makeup all day and doing whatever I could do to fulfill that monster inside that I wanted to build. As far as the slow times, the slow times are filled with education. And that's what's important. Now I realize people have a life, they have families sometimes they have to deal with, but you have to find a, a way to park that and fulfill what you want to do. The groundwork you're laying down now is going to follow you the rest of your life. If you waste two weeks, you will never get that two weeks back. It's nice to take a break, but you really have to focus because there's someone waiting there to just knock you out of the way and move past you. Tom Berman is definitely one of the, the mentors who guided me and helped me and gave me opportunities along the way. Uh, another makeup artist is Ken Chase, who's now retired. Ken also was a makeup artist on the Planet of the Apes. He did the makeup on Dr. Zaius. So I was fortunate to fall in with that caliber of makeup artist when I came out here. There was a film that I worked with on Tom called Space Hunter. It was a non-union film, and it was shot all on location in Utah, Moab, Utah, and Canada. I was working at the studio off and on in different jobs, and they needed someone to go on set for Space Hunter. Not to do the straight makeup, but to do all the character and prosthetics and effects makeup. It was a very low budget film, and they had one makeup artist to do the leads and the, the female actresses, so I went along solo with a big bag and box of prosthetics and did every alien, every scavengers on the desolate planet they were on, all the wounds on the stuntmen, all the fights, age makeups on this one character that's just in the script, old man. Of course, they bring in some guy who's 50 and he's gotta be 80. So it was really pulling everything out of my pocket that I'd learned in this short time to fulfill the needs of the director and working on a fast pace. And after two weeks, they fired the director and started over again. So I came right back we regrouped, we did more tests, went back again with Tom this time, got everything buttoned up. Tom came back to the lab and I continued with the show. After the Christmas break, we started big and brought up in Canada with a big makeup that Tom had been designing on Michael Ironside. And it was a character called Overdog. So Tom and I applied that makeup on Michael the whole time. And I remember Tom pulled me aside and I think from observing me, he had always given me encouragement and he said, how much money did you make last year? And I told him and he said, you know, you're gonna double it next year and you're going to double it the year after that and you're gonna do that for about five more years. You're going to double every year you make because you're really going to move on. That was the encouragement that I needed that made me feel like, well, I did this. And then I think superficially, after we came back and finished that film, I got a little side job that, again, they called Tom and he recommended it to me. It was for National Enquirer magazine. And they wanted to do a spread on what a makeup artist could do to a child. And the little girl in Poltergeist, Heather O'Rourke, was kind of big at the time. They wanted to see what she would look like in a little big man type makeup. I took the job, it wasn't a lot of money, but it was a lot of really good exposure. So I did a full Dick Smith overlapping nine piece prosthetic on a seven year old child, which is unheard of in the industry because of child labor laws and all that stuff. But if it's a private thing with a photographer, it flies under the radar. And she was up for it, her mom and her sister were there. And having worked with children a lot in the circus, I could be very entertaining. So I got her through this four and a half hour makeup and we did a great photo session of every step. We took her out onto the street and took pictures at bus stops next to the little ladies sitting on the bus stop. And it was a big spread in National Enquirer magazine. At that time, National Enquirer had that certain reputation, but it's not as bad as it is now. So it was a really educational, kind of a really cool feather in my cap. Visually, right on in print, that was a moment as well. So those two moments, when Tom pulled me aside and told me that I was moving to the next level, and then seeing something in print that I was proud of, it made all the difference. You know, it wasn't my best sculpting. It was my first attempt at something like this. Low budget, I made it in a week, but it was a challenge and I accepted it and it paid off. Networking is important. 
However, it needs to be done, I think, with reserve because you don't want to come off as someone who's gathering up all the, the goodies to move ahead. Sometimes being in the room with nothing added is the best way to network because you learn from whatever everyone else is talking about. But networking will also tell you where, where maybe the next job is or the next potential place to be. If you're in a school, it's a great place to network, not only with the teachers and, and instructors and administration, people who may have flown through the business, but with other students. You find out what they're doing to shine their craft a little bit, how to put together their work. You know, if someone has a really great portfolio of pictures, you know, find out what their approach is to that. And that's a good way to network. But networking is important, but you don't want to be too thirsty or too hungry, because it'll come off as such. Just shut up and be present sometimes is important. You've got a lot of people who have a lot of pressure to do their job. Being in the wrong place, not paying attention to where you're standing, don't set up a camp. We're in the day and age now where cell phones are part of everyday life and it's flopped into the sets a lot more than it should have. Being a department head, I rely on my phone many times for doing research, but I don't wanna see people sitting around playing games on their phone. It's counterproductive, it's not professional, doesn't work. So it really is about focusing what you're there to do. Be professional, don't voice your opinions so much. Don't try to be the actor's best friend and be their buddy. Maybe they're going to take you to their next show. You know, don't walk into someone else's trailer and start handing out your business cards. That's not networking, that's just gonna get you fired or not asked back. Etiquette's important. You know, don't leave your food laying around. You know, simple things of life, create a professional or about yourself. Oh, definitely, feature films, you have a lot more prep time. TV, it's hurry up. We want top quality, but in half the time, and it may not be shot as many times. The first time I did a television production was a mini series, and I did this really nice age makeup. I was ready to shoot it all day, and they did two takes. They go, okay, we're done, moving on. You can clean her up. Well, I was shocked at the, the amount of time you have to hit the mark in television. You know, first of all, you go through a lot of effort to do something creative and a very small portion may be seen and not even shot. In a film, they'll shoot it from all different directions and then they'll cut out what they what they don't want and keep what they do want. But television, sometimes you just have a fraction of the budget and the time to get it together and get it on camera and make sure it looks right in the light they provided and you've got to hit it right. So you've got to be prepared for plan B. Plan C. A feature, you have a little more time to draw it out. Also, a feature, you have a beginning, a middle, and an end of the story. Television, it's ongoing. It could be from one season to the next. So if you create a makeup that backs you into a corner, and that makeup has to be created later in a season and go further, but you've gone as far as you can go, you can overdo the makeup. So you have to look ahead so you don't make yourself up into a corner so you have nowhere to go later on. I think a great creative collaboration is first of all, taking a step back, looking at what you have to offer and looking what each individual person has to offer too. What are their expertise? What are they best at? It's not about trying to impress them with what you're bringing to the table. It's about holding back a little bit and seeing where you fit in best and allow everyone to say their piece and then find a discussed end to the project. Where can you go? And then you find that once you do that, you free everyone up to be creative and put everything into it. They're not afraid or in fear that you're there trying to take over. And in the same sense, if you are a very forceful person, being pushy and trying to take over too can offset your collaborators. So it's important to sit back and observe. You know, observing and understanding what's going around you is one of the most important things you can do as an artist in the motion picture and television industry because you've got a lot of egos you're dealing with. You've got actors' egos, you've got directors, you've got producers, you've got writers, you've got you trying to be creative. And because you're the closest one to the actor, you've got to understand the dynamic that happens between them and all those other players in the game. You are kind of a core of that. But if you're doing a big creative project, like say you're a Rick Baker or you're a Tom Berman or you're, you know, a Howard Berger doing a big lab, your collaborators are all your artists around you. And as an artist, you can only upgrade the work you do by surrounding yourself with the best people possible. I don't sculpt everything. I hire the best sculptor I can to do the work that's needed. That way it frees me up to put my input in that would allow that creative person to do the best they can do. So it's not about trying to wear all the hats. 
It's about choosing the thing that you can shine at the most and working with the other people who can then bring their best stuff to the table. You all succeed in the end that way. Minimalist. When I learned clown makeup, we were given four choices of color. White, black, red, flesh. Day after day, you did a makeup on yourself. You blended colors together. You learned to work with minimal amount of stuff. When I first got into the business, a makeup artist carried a makeup case and everything they did was in that case. They had a stack of bases, they had some eyeshadows, they had a brown and a black eyeliner, and it wasn't all these new, cool, newfangled tools that we have available to us today, which is great, but being on set, if you can carry everything you need, have it on your hip, have it in a little box, being prepared to do anything that's required of you without throwing your hands up and running back to the make makeup trailer with your actor making a big production out of it, those are the things that are going to make you valuable to production. It's because you can work with minimal tools, minimal amount of makeup and supplies and get the job done in a timely basis. I carry a, a side bag that's got my brushes, it's got my blood, it's got my dirt bag, it's got all of my gadgets and things that I may need to pull rabbits out of my hat. That makes me crazier than seeing someone carrying a clear plastic bag full of beauty products and the actor's cell phone and their tea and their favorite mints and their eye drops and their notepad and their iPad. I call that spaghetti. You know, it's just too much. Nothing worth getting in and out of a van up on a mountain somewhere in Podunk, Iowa, and you've got a ton of stuff. You gotta carry with you everything you need and be prepared to do anything that's required of you as an artist. Tom Berman's always been there for me. If I have a question about how to do something, I would call him. Sometimes collaboration isn't so much about the artistic side, it's how to deal with a director or an actor or producer. If you're going to do the makeup on a particular actor, you call their other makeup artist who's done them before and say, hey, what do they like? Do they like shading under the chin? Do they like stuff around their eyes? You know, that way you walk in and you can say, hi, I talked to so-and-so, they said that you kind of like this or that. Those are kind of collaborations that help you fulfill what you need to do. So doing a little homework on your actors is important. So being able to make those phone calls and ask what's your experience in this field, those are the best types of collaboration that I've found that have been helpful to me. Because I've worked in a lot of non-union films and slasher films and stuff off the book of a union production, but it was for a union. At the Burma studio, I worked a lot with, you know, Star Trek and Buckaroo Banzai and stuff like that. But once I got in the union, the doors opened up. And once V knew that I'd gotten in the union, she could call on me. We had done a little non-union film with permission from her union so she could do it. And we spent a lot of time together as a movie called Slapstick with Jerry Lewis and Madeline Kahn. So it's V, myself, and Jerry and Madeline in a room four hours a day for you know a couple months so she got to see my chairside manner we did tests together so she saw what I was able to bring to the table I knew Greg Canham from just you know association and she called me up and said hey I got this vampire movie you want to do it and I go yeah sure let's do that we went to Warner Brothers and I met Joel Schumacher and it was all about getting ready for the big vampire movie. V took me to the makeup store and showed me how to shop. She goes, don't get this stuff off the shelf. Let's go into the back room and just fill a box. So she coached me through those little baby steps that you need to know to get into a production. And it was a real creative, fun atmosphere. First thing we did was go to Santa Cruz and do everything that was necessary before the big vampire makeup started working. So I was there for the first test that Greg did on one of the players. So we saw the makeup get chosen. Greg then, with his crew, perfected it and got it down. And we got all of our little pieces. And it was about cranking out a makeup and making it happen on the four vampires and then getting it on stunt doubles. So it just grew and grew and grew. It was a really fun experience. Right after Lost Boys, V and I were doing a commercial for Berman. Tom Berman had done a commercial. They were doing caricatures of Rodney Dangerfield coming out of a spaceship for a beer commercial. So we're putting masks on, on these actors and they're all wearing the same suit and they're doing digital whatever they're doing. And we had a little break, so we're walking up and down to the commissary. And she sees a sign, uh, production office for Beetlejuice. She goes, oh, I know the guy. I know the producer from that. Let's go up and see what's going on. So we kind of go up the stairs and she kind of walks her way into the office. And I kind of just hang out there and maybe decide to go next door to the commissary and get a coffee. And she comes out and she goes, I think I got this job. So she, on her side, kind of cultivated that relationship 
She met Tim Burton, went from there, and then she called and said, hey, let's do this movie. It's called Beetlejuice. And Tim Burton directing it, he did Pee Wee's Big Adventure, and I know Paul Rubens, and I had met Paul too. So it's kind of a, you know, it's a family of, of artists in that, in that time. We got on board with Beetlejuice, and at the time I was working on a Michael Jackson video on the same lot. And I got called for two days that went two weeks, just doing, you know, beauty makeup on dancers. And pretty soon the trailer shows up, and V finally says, okay, you gotta quit that show and jump onto this one to do tests. So we did. I left one makeup room, put my box in the makeup up trailer and we started doing tests and I had worked on a show called Spaceballs a few months before where they had been introducing a type of airbrush makeup to be used as kind of a fantasy makeup so I told V about it and we called the guy who developed the makeup and he kind of came over and showed us all the pros and cons to using it so we went full bore playing with airbrush makeups and all the bright colors that that were utilized in the film. So it was, a, it was a fun collaboration. I was able to bring some of my lab skills and I made the teeth for Michael. I made the nose piece for him, which was basically um, some stock pieces that I had used on another job for making a broken nose. And it was just subtle things that came into it. And it's not that it's an elaborate makeup, it's just a very effective makeup. And Michael brought 90% of that character to life. I had a studio at the time and Jeff Don, who'd been doing Arnold's makeup for years, back in the old non-union days of the first Terminator. Jeff had gone off, we got in the union together, we took our union tests together. He'd gone his way, I'd gone my way. He was doing a little movie with Arnold called Running Man. He had a makeup artist he was going to work with who was one of his mentors, and he couldn't start for like a month into the production, so Jeff asked me to start the film with him. Jeff called me and basically offered me to do the movie with him. I had a studio running, but a job was just finishing, and I said, okay, I'll shut the studio down or sublet it and go to the set, which seemed to be what the universe was doing. It's pulling me off of this makeup lab and onto the set because I'm a people person. I like working with people. I like working in a team and I like working in a large circus. As uh, we developed and got into this and we had meetings at Cameron's and we saw where it was going, we saw something that was really gonna be state of the art. We also had a fun time with, with Robert Patrick who played the T-1000. We had doubles to make. We had little cheek pieces and muzzle pieces and nose pieces for the various stunt doubles uh, for Arnold and for Robert. And we had one in particular day where he falls into the vat at the end of the film and he's melting and transforming into all of these, these characters. Well, to make it work properly, we had to make them up with extra dark makeup because the lights were so bright coming out of the pit that they were in. And the confection that they were slopping around in was a combination of water, mineral oil, and confectioner's sugar with lights underneath so it looks like a boiling pit of molten metal. Well, Robert had to go through these various formations, and if you think about the T-1000, he's solid metal. So he could take the hard form of one character that he has touched and turned into and shift to the other character. So in order to do it, we did you know the mechanical sword arms on him. He was the woman that he changed into. He was the security guard that he changed into. He was the helicopter pilot, and at one point he had a helmet on his head. The final makeup version of that was his hair perfectly combed, almost like in that Elvis hairstyle, in chrome. And it had to be glued to his head, around his head, with his own hair up inside. It was a hollow plastic fiberglass helmet, but it looked like hair. And Robert had to be made up very dark, with a very dark base. I used rubber mask grease base, but he looked super tan, like a George Hamilton look. And you couldn't see on camera, but the lights were so bright that it would wash him out. It was late. It was almost, it was Christmas Eve coming up. You know, Jeff had gone home early. I was just covering Robert. And Cameron, you know, being outspoken as he was, would always ask, what's the problem? If a problem would would prop up that may slow down his filming. So I had all this piece glued onto Robert and Robert starts slopping around in the water and the hair piece keeps popping up and falling off. Jim goes into this explanative about like, what's the problem with the makeup? And I shot back as well. The first problem is you've got him slopping around in a big vat of makeup remover. He looks, he goes, what are you talking about? I goes, think about it. He's in mineral oil. You've got him bobbing in and out like a tea bag, and you wanna know why the makeup's not staying on? So he, he took it to heart and kept him up out of the water a little bit, and we cleaned him up and got through the process. But it was one of those interesting times where you have to stand up to the director for no other reason, just to be practical. That was a little moment there that was kind of fun, because Jim and I had bumped heads a couple of times throughout the production. It was my way of getting him back. You know, I started out in television. I, I got in the union at NBC, which is TV and, and stuff, and from that segued and got my union days and worked mostly in feature films. As 
time would allow, the, the industry kind of left California, it went to Canada for a while, it went to North Carolina, then it kind of drizzled down into New Orleans and, and Atlanta and that area. So a lot of work had left town, a lot of feature films, and it was it had been kind of slow for about six months. I day checked a little bit on different shows, a little bit on Star Trek or whatever, but I didn't have any feature films, and I was known as a feature guy. We were actually at Disneyland, and I started calling while we're waiting on rides. I called ADI looking, say, hey guys, you got anything going on? I was just kind of calling around. And I heard about a show that was being done in Hawaii, and I heard that a producer, a friend of mine, was involved in it. So I called her and said, so what's this movie, this show you got in Hawaii, what's the deal? And she goes, oh, it's this, we did a pilot and it was the most expensive pilot ever done for television. This new director, J.J. Abrams did it and you know, he's a hot new thing in Hollywood, but I need to give the makeup artist who did the pilot first right of refusal. And if you're really interested, you got it if she doesn't want to do it. So I'm at Disneyland eating my pizza, waiting on rides, making those, networking phone calls and about a week later she calls me up and said hey um, I'd like to send a tape over so you can watch the pilot because our makeup artist decided she didn't want to do it and you're on if you want it so they sent me this video of, of Lost and I watched it and I go oh that looks easy people on an island you know like Robinson Crusoe survival should be fun and I took the job and it, be a, it was a matter of trying to now get a crew together well they didn't allow me to take a crew I had to use who was in Hawaii and at the time two other series were filming there so all of the good workers were taken up and I said well I need to take someone can I take a hairstylist or a makeup artist with me they said either one but you can't bring both I finally found a makeup artist who could go with me, someone I'd worked with back at NBC. And we went into it, we dove into the pit, into a small trailer that was not big enough to do the work with 14 main actors, with a show that we had no idea what was going to go backwards in time to the lives of these actors off island, which meant if they had a beard on the island, they couldn't have a beard there. So we had to find ways to incorporate into the storyline the reason they didn't have these big Robinson Crusoe beards. They got to find stuff. They got to find toiletries. They got to take care of themselves. So that kind of became my drive to make my job a little easier. You know, and they wouldn't tell me from one show to the next what was coming up. They Either they hadn't written it or it was such a secretive environment that I didn't get a lot of information. So I found that career change moving into a television series, film quality on a TV budget, on location. We didn't have the backup of just calling the union to get extra help and having to work with what I would say is kind of the second string of of people available in the location you're working. Eventually, us being the last show to get started, we were kind of the red-headed stepchild. The other shows didn't get picked up for the back nine, and we did. So we're the ones who prevailed and moved forward for six seasons. I think the big takeaway was learning how to delegate and trust your crew and train the crew to do like you would do. Because we had multiple units working, we had multiple actors working, we had doubles. I had to create makeups that wouldn't, again, back us into a corner. Create a makeup that wasn't so difficult or involved that someone else could, could do it. I created these makeup palettes of the right colors that I used, the bruise colors, the shadowing colors. And I created a makeup palette for all my artists to use. I worked with PPI creating a tattoo palette. So we were all doing the same shades of bruises or the same shades of blood or everything. So it was about spreading your fingers out and someone could go across the island and match something that I had done. So it was a good takeaway of learning delegation and training your crew. You know, if you had something new to train them, pull them in early and show them how to do something on a weekend. You know, I was making prosthetics. We were punching full chest pieces of hair. We were making surgical pieces, full Silicone makeups that just started to come into the makeup field, so we made that transition and a lot of new techniques. I was forced to learn on my own, on location. I had worked on uh, on ER quite a bit back in, in, in its day. Um, had taken over a portion of the show at one point when one of the makeup artists had a knee surgery, so I did some of the makeup gags on the show. And I call them gags because that's what they are. It's like a, a quick little effect, you know, a pin in the face, a surgical procedure. So that was my first introduction into that on camera. Of course, being around Tom Berman and using a lot of those same you know, blood gags and stuff way back on Space Hunter and then communicating with Tom over the years, I picked up a lot of really cool tricks. By the time Code Black came around, all that machine was well oiled. I had worked on a show by the same producer of Code Black called Intelligence, which was with Josh Holloway from Lost. And you see how one thing leads to the next? So that show only went 13 shows, 
we did some really cool makeup effects on it. We did bleeding noses, bleeding ears, some really cool bullet wound gags. And when the producer got in contact with me about Code Black, it was basically based on an actual documentary of the emergency department at County Hospital. So we had all this footage of all these real procedures. And then I met the doctor who shot the video and he was the executive producer. So we had a big powwow. We sat down and talked about all the things to do. And I knew it was beyond the realm of lab work that I could create. But as a consequence of time in the business, Tom Berman had retired and one of his shining lights in his studio Vincent Van Dyke took over his space. And Vincent became my go-to for the large lab jobs and the lab work. So I knew they could free me up to design the effects that I wanted to do, work with production, work with my other artists, get the late night jobs done somewhere else so that I could then be free to then do the creative, bring it to camera portion of the makeups. And it was a bit like in the military. It, you had to carry things on you. You had to have rolling carts with blood and pumps and all these little gags for doing quick IV insertions, um, tongue depressor in a mouth and blood squirts out, you know, foaming, coughing up, all these little elements that are not what you would call makeup effects but they're out of kit makeup gags coupled with prosthetics and then a few makeup effects. So it was a very big melting pot of makeup and it had to involve beauty makeup. And I knew after the pilot that I had to delegate a lot of my work so I could sit on top and control the chessboard with all of my players. Our production meetings were long. Every show would usually have maybe a two to three hour meeting about breaking down everything that's going to happen in the script. I like to wear a walkie talkie on set so I can communicate with the ADs and hear what's going on. So I would sit in these production meetings, listening to the set, excusing myself from time to time to go and talk about something on the walkie talkie and still maintain the interest in the meeting so I could come up with gags for the next show sometimes two shows in advance. So I'm literally working on the script we just finished to do pickup shots, the script that we're shooting currently, and designing and coming up with ideas that are new and inventive for the next script coming down the line. And once in a while seeing an opportunity that says, hey, why don't we do this? This would be better than that. Let's do this, this would look visually cool. So it gave me a little bit of creative freedom to work with the writers and producers. And it put me in, in, in a position, not of power, but of creative drive forward to help them achieve what they want with something interesting for screen. And it was a blast, it was great. I had a, a six person makeup crew. We had two trailers. One trailer was dedicated solely to our background artists who would funnel through anywhere from 50 a day to maybe 10 who had various injuries in the in the waiting room, injuries from chainsaw accidents to gardeners with weed whackers, kitchen knife accidents, you know, whatever we could come up with that would look cool and inviting on camera. Vincent made a lot of stock prosthetics. I sculpted a lot of stock stuff. I had beauty makeup artists putting on prosthetics or at least standing by with them on the set when we were busy back in the trailers. Unfortunately, couldn't do all the fun stuff. So I would usually choose one or two things to show that I could do or a day player would come in who was a featured character in the show and something special would work on them throughout the show. And I would usually take that person over and, and do them for the one show, they would be on their way and I could then focus on the next show. So I spent a lot of time with, with two notebooks, this show, that show, and this is the script for the next show. So I had my little office set up and my blood station set up and everyone knew everyone's job so we could work as a military unit, like a mass unit. One thing I think is important is to maintain a balance between your work life, your artistic life, and your home life. If you're fortunate enough to have a family, make them part of the creative process. Always include them in your decisions. I mean, whenever I would be offered a job or a show, I always talk to my wife first. So what do you think? It goes out of town, it does this, and here's the pros, here's the cons. Ultimately, I'm the one doing the jobs, but I always try to include my families into it. I remember when I was offered to do Scorpion King with The Rock, I told my daughter and she goes, you better do that movie because I want to meet The Rock. And my son goes, you better do Terminator because I want to meet Schwarzenegger. And it became the thing to, my kids would always love to come to set if we're blowing something up. You want to come to set? I don't know. Are you blowing something up? I go, I think I can arrange that. 
Good advice I can give for students, because we do live in a day of where you can pay for further education, is don't waste your money. You know, my time is valuable as a teacher. I don't want to teach someone who doesn't want to be there and doesn't want to learn. In the same sense, a student who's going to an educational program, that's like the gold ring for you. You may learn something that will take you the rest of your career. And if you look the wrong way, you're going to miss it. So focus, do what you're there to do. Learn, always try to get better. And you can learn from anywhere. As a teacher, I learn from students because I learn their approach. I look at the way they look at something for a temporary moment. And that can help me how to teach someone the next week. So you never stop learning, no matter how high you may grow in this business, you never stop learning and never be afraid to admit that you want to learn something new. Thank you for watching In The Chair.